Okay, so in our short day today, let's go ahead and see what we can do within that. So when you first look at number 13, and I wish I hadn't drawn this little line through there so much, but if you look at it really critically and you see three to the two X plus three to the X minus two, it might have this vaguely familiar, like, wait a minute, I think I've seen you before. Does it look vaguely familiar in terms of its structure to something you have seen? Anybody have an idea what that vague look is? Okay, so what are you shaking your head? What do you think it looks like? Yeah, it has that look of a quadratic, doesn't it? So this is a weird, like, little quasi-quadratic story. So um, this is a trick that we use a lot of times in math. Um, the further I go in math, the harder the problems get, the more I use these tricks, especially if I see something that seems a little bit out of place, is it's called U substitution. So, and it doesn't have to be the letter U, but it's one that people tend to use. <clears throat> so let's imagine I just said, let's let U be three to the X. And U is just a distinctive letter that's fairly easy. Most problems use X and Y, so we don't use those. U is just sort of a, nobody uses it kind of a thing. So if you look right here, this three raised to the two X is actually U squared. What is three to the X? It's U itself. And so when Asa said that looks vaguely quadratic, it doesn't look vaguely quadratic, it's identically quadratic, isn't it? <clears throat> so what would you guys do to solve that quadratic? And, and I did land a plane yesterday probably a little harder than I meant to because almost everybody's like, oh, I'm just gonna complete the square on everything. Remember factoring was supposed to be the easiest way. So can you come up with two numbers whose product and sum do that? It's, it's gonna be, Oh, uh, yeah, 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 positive two and negative one. Now, if that's the case, then what does that make U? So again, this product is zero, so what does U have to be? One or negative two. Now, the only thing about doing it this way is, see right here, this is a little hint. I just said, let this be the case. U is just something I made up, right? The problem didn't ask you to solve for u. What did it ask you to solve for? X. Oh, so I'm not quite done because I don't want to know what u is. I want to know what x is. So I have these two stories right here. I have three to the x is one and I have three to the x equals negative two. Because after you substitute it in, you have to get rid of it again. That is the downside to doing this. It simplifies the problem, but it also extends it. So can you answer this question? Three raised to what power is one? Zero. Hmm, that was pretty easy. Three raised to what power is negative two? <clears throat> Now, a lot of you are thinking hard about that, but let me remind you something. Three to the X is, is an exponential growth curve that looks like this, isn't it? Negative two is down here. Where do they cross? They don't. So when is this true? Never. Oh, so in other words, this is the only solution. That literally is all that worked. So what do you guys think you're gonna call this one over here? What are you gonna call you in that one? What is the little piece that appears to be a repeating throughout the problem is four to the X, right? So in this problem, and I'm not gonna finish this problem, I'm just gonna say, I would say start with U equals four to the X and then see what happens. <clears throat> now, what I wanted to do with you guys for a few moments today is <clears throat> go over some a little bit less less orthodox problems. And um, so that's gonna hit here. And some of that has to do with application. So I'm gonna kind of pull this thing over here to the side. Um, something that I skipped the other day was this first problem that I have where you have 
and I'm, I'm going to start without word problems and then I'll work our way into word problems. So every time you have a math problem in which there is a variable in the exponent, one thing you want to know is the best way to handle a variable in, a, in an exponent is to take a log. Because the big property that we had was specifically property number three. What was the log base A of B to the C? What was the whole story there? Is if you have a logarithm, what happens to exponents? They jump in front, don't they? The fact that those jump in front becomes very, very helpful. So if you have something of this nature, the first thing I would encourage you guys to do is isolate the exponential piece. I mean, that's kind of the same that we've done before when we had absolute values or square roots or anything else. We always isolated that funky thing. But now that it's sitting there, could I take a log of both sides? What would happen if I take a log of both sides? What's going to happen to that x? It's going to jump in front. Now, here's the thing. What log base can I use? Could I use base 10 if I wanted to? I could, but that would be really dumb. What base should I use in this case? Let's use base E log because this is log base E. So keep in mind, if I come into this problem and I take the log base E, which is ln of both sides, by definition, there's another thing that you know we've used but did you guys know that the log base A of A to the B is, what is that? It is plain old B, because the question is A raised to what power is A to the B? Well, it's B. So what is the natural log of E to the minus X? It's just minus X. So what is the only thing I would have left to do to get X 100% isolated? Change the sign. So that's it. Now, what would happen if we change the sign, you could answer this, that question this way. I feel like I don't like how I wrote that. So you could either say X is this, but guys, let's look at this little rule right here. If exponents become coefficients, couldn't coefficients become exponents? The reason I bring that up is I could do this and you have to study that ever so slightly and think about what I just did. What did I do to the fraction? I flipped it. Why? What is a negative exponent? Isn't a negative exponent just a reciprocal? Guys, here's the deal. Many, many of you will end up facing college placement tests when you go off to school, right? Now, when you go to college, how, what, how much does a, a class cost you? Do you guys know? Any idea what it costs to take a class? Something like 30 grand a year. So if you parse that out, you're probably talking a couple thousand dollars per class. So if you went into college and then you didn't do well on the placement test and they decided that you're going to take Algebra 2 again and you're going to pay $2,000 to take Algebra 2, would you be happy? you'd be decidedly unhappy. But those placement tests have to be graded quickly, don't they? Because they have thousands of freshmen coming in and doing them. Some schools do them, some don't. You guys will have a benefit, especially if you're dual enrolled because you're like, nope, no placement test for me. I have a transcript. But if it's a multiple choice test and you did the work and you got that, and then you look at the multiple choice and that answer is not there because that was the one, that's kind of a booger, isn't it? Would I accept that answer? 100%, but on multiple choice, they might tweak it a little bit. So you just want to watch for those little tricks more for those experiences than for anything else. Okay, so let's go ahead and head on. So sorry about this, word problem time. We've got to do a couple of word problems, kind of take us through a little bit of a story. So what do you guys know that rabbits, like in, in our society, what are rabbits famous for? Breeding. That's what they are famous for. You put a few rabbits out there and all of a sudden you get a whole lot of rabbits. And that's actually been a, a problem because right around Easter, 
there's a lot of people who go, oh, bunny rabbits, those are nice. Let me get a bunny rabbit. And they get a bunny rabbit and they love it for like a week. And then they're like, oh my gosh, this thing is a massive rodent and it pees and it makes the whole house smell bad. So what do they do? They take it out into the country and they let the rabbit go. By the way, that's also how uh, uh, Florida got inhabited with boa constrictors because people were like, oh, a snake is fun. This thing is massive. Let's let it go in the nature. It's fine. Now it's taking over. So, so let's say we have rabbits. Rabbits are increasing. So we've got some wildlife biologists. I'm going to kind of try to brief this down a little bit so I'm not writing a huge paragraph, but I've got some wildlife biologists and they go out and they've got some of them tagged and they're looking at them. They're increasing at 27% twice a year. In other words, the guy goes, um, goes out, he surveys the population and six months ago it was here, now it's 27% more. Six months later, it's another about 20 27% more. So if 78 rabbits were present initially, when will there be, <clears throat> let's say 200? Now, we actually did this problem, or one very similar, the, the, the verbiage was different, it was population of a city instead of rabbits, but it's really the same concept. So let's start with it. How do all of these problems start? We start with 78. Remember, the, 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 the amount that you have at time t is your initial condition, right? In this case, 78. What goes inside the parentheses? It was supposed to be one plus R. What, what was R? R was your, your rate. And it was supposed to be raised to the T power. That's kind of how we played this game. So in my story, I know that I had 78 rabbits. That was my initial condition. What did we say was happening? They were increasing by 27%. So what's going to go inside my parenthetical? 1 plus 0.27 or 1.27. What was the, the 1 again? 1 was the 100% of the rabbits. Now, in, in, in rabbits, well, you don't always have 100% of your rabbits because your foxes are going to come get it. But, but what this is saying is you're going to have some death because you are going to have some predation. But they're also breeding fast enough to not only take care of that, but also grow on top of that. And it says that it's happening twice a year, isn't it? So notice I didn't wait for the end of the year to get that 20%, 27. It, it happens twice a year. So this is my master equation, right? But what do I want to know? When is it 200? Now earlier, I had you graph this. I had you graph this which is kind of lame, and we look for where they cross. Could I still do that if I wanted to? On a test, could you still go down that road <clears throat> to find out what the actual answer is? Yeah, but one of the rules that I gave you a moment ago is that anytime you have a variable in an exponent, what do you do? How did I get the variable out of the exponent? I took a log, because that log allows me to move that variable in front. So the first thing that I personally would do is I would divide both sides by 78. So keep in mind, the first thing I'm going to do is, is I'm going to isolate the exponential, which if you look back here, I went through all of the process to get e to the x isolated. So I'm going to go through the process of getting 1.27 to the 2t isolated. So I've got 2.564 equals 1.27 to the 2t power. That looks kind of ugly, doesn't it? Now, what log should I take? Because I can take any base log that I want to. What base do you like? Base what? Two? We could do base two, and, and we could, but unfortunately, my calculator doesn't have that one. So I'm going to either use base 10 or base E, just because I'm going to be lazy and I'm going to use my technology here. So let's use a common log this time. 
Now again, what was the whole reason we would take the log of both sides? Why do we do that? Okay, go back to this thing. Why do we take the log? Is because what do logs allow to happen is it allows exponents to just become little wimpy coefficients. So if I took the log of this side, what's gonna happen to the 2t? It's gonna be pushed in front. Now, do you guys have your machines? Now I wanna kinda of stress something because this is a math class, not a science class. I don't think that's a big surprise to anybody in the room that we are in math, not science. Um, but in math classes, we will write down rounded numbers, but I don't ever round in my calculator. I leave all of it. So even though I wrote 2.564 here, my calculator still remembers this and I never hit clear. So my answer for T is going to be the log of this 2.5 dude divided by two of these log 127s. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the log of the answer. Now A and S answer is gonna be all of this line right here and I haven't done anything to round it, have I? Divided by, now to get T by itself, what do I wanna divide by? I wanna get rid of the two, so I'm gonna divide by two. What else do I wanna get rid of? The log of 1.27, so two logs of 1.27. Now, will that get rid of everything on that side of the equation? Except for T, I, I divided by the two, I divided by the log, and this says, hey, how long do I need to wait for the bunny rabbit population to hit 200? 1.969 what? What was T in? Years. So for all intents and purposes, this is two years later, I'm gonna hit that magic 200 bullet. So, so I would say T is in approximately 1.9, I'm gonna go 970 years. Okay, so is it that hard to solve problems that are exponential in nature? Wasn't that bad, because what do you have to do? The big trick, just take a log. So let's see if we can do one of those without me telling you every little step of the way. Okay, so your next little problem is the following. Um, let's say you have a, a radioactive material so we have 16 grams of an isotope are decaying at 4.3% per year. When will there be nine grams of the isotope? So let's see if number one, can we accurately come up with the master equation that describes this isotope? So was that enough time to set up your equation? Just to set it up? Paz, can you set it up for me? Yes, it is 16. What's gonna go in the parentheses? Um, 
kind of a significant detail is that it's decaying, right? So what are we gonna do? We're gonna subtract, so that's 0.9, What happens if you decay at 4.3%? Nine, five, seven, I think. 0.957. And it just said per year, so I'm done. I mean, that's literally the whole story. It just, that's what we have. And what do I wanna know? Instead of setting that equal to A of T, what do I want to know? When will it be nine? Okay. So the strategy that I gave you is first, before you do anything else, let's get that exponential all by itself. So what is in the way that's, that's kind of gonna make it harder at first? The 16. So what do you do? How do you get rid of the 16? Divide. So we got nine sixteenths. Now, hey, we've got it isolated. How do you get that variable out of that exponent? Log it. What kind of log do you wanna do? Base 10, sure. I got the log base 10, and when I do this log, what's gonna happen to the T? It's gonna pop in front, so all I need to do clear is I need to take the log of 9 sixteenths, and then what am I gonna divide by since this T is sitting in front? The log of 0.957. The log of 0.957 was... 13.09, T is 13.09 what? Okay, now, so in about 13 years, we're gonna be down to that particular value. So have you guys studied isotopes and all that stuff in chemistry a little bit? Do you guys know what happens? So, you know, you'll have, um, in the periodic table, there's stable values of things, and sometimes a, 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 a a molecule will have like maybe too many electrons, but they can give those things out. And, and so that it decays from its current state into one that's a little bit more stable. So like carbon has a stable state and then there's an unstable state, which is how they do with all the carbon dating. Um, have you guys heard of carbon dating? When they do that, what they do is they know how much of a certain state of that carbon there is. And then they look at how much of of it has become into that stable state and they know how long it takes to get there so they can backdate to find out about how long ago that thing died. Um, now, is it fully accurate? You wish. It's not because there's a lot of assumptions that have to be made about like the fact that the environment had to be stable as well. Does our environment change? Would heat change the way something decays? And I think you all know full well that our planet is, does not stay at a stable heat, right? Have we had ice ages? You've heard of those. We've also had hot times. I mean, it does change over time. So the, the model is limited. So that's why they won't say it's exactly this old. They will just say it's about this old because we've had some hot, but we've also had some cold, so it kind of balances out. Now, there's a word that I have not used yet today. Anybody know what magic little word I haven't actually brought up that showed up in a bunch of the problems back when we first did this? It was a really significant word. What was that? Continuous. Yes. So anytime in a problem you hear the word continuous, <clears throat> That tells you, you change the story that the amount is the initial condition times E to the RT. That just changes stuff. Now, in reality, is this isotope over here, did it actually decay continuously? It actually did, but the reality is the scientist wasn't there to study it continuously. The scientist was looking at the dumb thing and says, well, I look here, and then a year later, I looked again. It was continuous, but I modeled it another way. So here's what we're going to do. So let's say we have a radioactive um, material of some sort is decreasing because radioactive material is always in that state of decreasing unless you did something really sophisticated with um, 
you know, some enriching thing that's really hard to do is decreasing continuously. Uh, shoot, is is continuously at twelve percent per year. Now, that's kind of how they do this kind of stuff, and I, I'm, I kind of would like to go go through some of that, but I don't have a whole lot of time. Um, if there was initially twelve. If initially there is 12 units of the product, what is the half-life? Now, the thing is, is in science, you guys have probably heard of half-life, haven't you? If you have not heard of half-life, who, who in here has actually heard the term half-life? Half-life is a really common thing because rather than telling you this kind of stuff, they like to talk about half-lives and they use that term for like every single thing out there. And I could show you a quick Google search. If you look up any isotope, you can just type in what it's half-life. They have studied all of it and that's just what they do. So if you used to have say 12, then what's the half-life gonna be? It's how much time it takes for 12 to become six. And then how long it takes six to become three and then three to become one and a half, etc. So Here's how we're going to do it. It says we have 12 units. It says it's decaying at 12% per year, correct? And what do I want to know? When is the thing going to be all the way down to six? Well, here's the silly thing. Did I even need to tell you that it was 12? The reality is I didn't because what's the first thing you're going to do to isolate the exponential is you're going to divide both sides by 12, aren't you? and G, you're gonna get 0.5 because it's half-life, no big deal. I could have, I didn't even need to tell you that, but most students, if I don't give you the initial condition, they're like, oh, what do I do? Well, if you don't, just put a one there. Just assume you had one, and then what are you gonna have? Half, because it's gonna be half of anything. So how do you get the dumb variables out of the exponent? This is easy this time. What base should I use? Heck yeah, we're gonna use base E because as soon as I use base E over here, notice I don't need to write a natural log because the natural log of E is one. So the only thing I need to do is take the natural log of a half and divide it by negative 0.12. And so the natural log of 0.5 divided by negative 0.12 is 5.77 years. So what should happen in, ooh, I wrote that poorly. That's 5.77 years, not 577.6. So what's gonna happen in about 11 years? What should happen in about 11? How many half-lives would that be? Wouldn't that be two half-lives? So 12 turned into six and then six turned into three. That's kind of what, what would happen in about 17 years? Instead of three, it would be now one and a half. It just kind of hangs on and that's just how these things play out. So the last little thing that I thought would be really good to look at, and this is a little funky, but uh, I will do my best to make this make sense to you. Huh. You guys have actually heard a little bit about earthquakes, right? And how do they measure earthquakes? You guys know what scale they use for earthquakes? It's hard. You guys don't, you live up here. You don't experience, I lived in LA for a while. I was like, oh yeah, I know all about that one. It's called the Richter scale. Now that I say it, you guys, you guys have heard Richter scale before, haven't you? So a Richter scale is a scale that kind of gives you a little bit of a feel for how it works. So a Richter scale is kind of a strange little story. You take the log, and by the way, I'm literally gonna write log, meaning what base is it right now? It's gonna be base 10. It's gonna be, it's A over T, so when an earthquake hits and everybody's like, oh, hey, what was it on the Richter scale? They don't tell you right away. It takes a little bit for them to figure it out. 
It's A over T plus B, where the following is the truth. A is the amplitude. And we're gonna study this later on, but an amplitude of a wave is, if this is like the ground is steady, your amplitude as the wave progresses, the height of the wave is right there. Now, if you're in a, biz, in, 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 a, in a building and it's a high wave, is that gonna mean much to you? Think on that for a second. Your building is literally moving a distance. Now, I'm, I'm driving it this way and the, the wave may actually go back and forth this way. It's like, how far do you move, okay? Is that a significant thing? But not only that is important, it's, it's how far you move back and forth, but how quickly would you go from here to here? Would that matter? So let's just say the amplitude, it moved you five feet. You're like five feet, but if it was a big lazy five feet and you came back, you'd be like, ooh, that was kind of weird. But what if it was five feet and you got over and back really fast? What would that do to a building? It's gonna shear it off its foundation if you did it really super fast. So the second part of that, the T stands for its period, like how fast that wave goes. So how big it is, but how fast it actually does all of that. And then there's a last little piece, which is called B, and that's actually called its weakening factor. So there's certain kind of conditions that naturally dampen um, imagine you guys, did you guys know like if you talk, you're creating a wave? And I'm actually modeling something. The amplitude is how strong your wave is. It's how loud you are. When you're talking, the louder you are, the higher your amplitude is. But your period is actually how high you are. So every time you inflect, you're actually making that period quicker. You're making the wave go faster. But instead of like being here, what if we all got in a pool and I tried to talk to you? You wouldn't hear very much because instead of the air, which is gonna allow the stuff to move around very easily, the water is going to like absorb all of that and make it harder. You guys follow me on that? Well, the same thing happens. There's some soil that actually takes that wave and it dampens it out very, very quickly so it doesn't radiate very far. But there's other places that don't. And one of those places is San Francisco. So you guys know a little bit of the history of San Francisco, how it's fallen down. It's almost like comical if it wasn't like killed so many people, but they literally built the thing and then it fell over. And so they paved over the top and they built right on top of it. And then it did it again. And so what did they do? They built right on top of it again. What is the San Francisco built on? It's built on rubble. It is. It's built on fill, like they literally just push dirt into the ocean and then they just crush the buildings down and they just build right back on top of it. So what actually happens is when you get an earthquake, they call it liquefaction in San Francisco, that the ground turns into pudding. If you're in a building that is sitting on top of pudding, how's that going to go for you? It's a really, 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 really bad place to be during an earthquake because literally the ground turns into liquid. But if you are in, say, Las Vegas or something, is the ground going to be that kind of same? You know, it's not. Or if you're up in the mountains, things are stronger. So there's this weakening factor. So here's kind of our story. In 1995, and that feels like a long time ago, because it kind of was, in Kobe, Japan, there was a, there was a, uh, there was a, a there was a, uh, an earthquake and it was, it was crazy. They showed videos of this thing, a 7.2. Do you guys know how big a 7.2 is? 7.2 is big. It's, it's a whopper. It is a massive earthquake. It's, it's um, the pictures they showed some security videos of some shops and man, there was just product and people flying all over the place. I mean, you got nothing. Like if the ground doesn't stay put, you're just flying all over the place. It was a pretty scary thing. But then um, I was actually in this one. In LA, in 1994, there was one that was a 6.6. I quite, I, 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 I really did. I thought I was going to die in that one. I thought I was done. I lived in this very, very old apartment. The manager did not take care or the owner did not take care of anything. So when it started shaking, what did I think was gonna happen? 
I was in the bottom story and I thought, okay, well, I will be buried in this thing because there's just not much. And I've never been in an earthquake before, so it scared the pants off of me. I mean, it's one thing to hear about an earthquake, to live it. Holy smokes, it was scary. And so, you know, I was hovering, you know, I did what you're supposed to do, which is get into a door jam, which helps in some triangulation. But man, this 6-6, six, six, so, so how much bigger is this than that? So you're like, oh, 0.6, not, not that much different, is it? So like this one scared me to death. It really did. So 7.2, should that be a lot more or just a little bit more? It's actually a lot more. So let's kind of go through that process. So according to this, the, the, the difference of the two was just 0.6, wasn't it? But kind of what happens is um, LA is sitting right on the water, isn't it? Tokyo is, or Kobe, Japan is actually also sitting on the, as it turns out, they're geologically almost the same, which means the B values are the same. So in this case, the B values for both are common. So if you go ahead and you take a look at these equations, then the log of A over T minus the log of A over T it was supposed to be about 0.6. And so if you go through the problems and you actually put them together and we just divide them, you could say the log, so keep in mind when you subtract that allows you to divide, you end up having this thing right here equaling 0.6. Um, now it just so it so happens that when they did all of that, the amp the period was the same in both. It was really the amplitude, it was the amount of movement that was different. Um, what's the base on LOG? 10. So if you divide, which is a way to compare how much how many times bigger one of them is than the other, that would be 10 raised to the 0.6. Well, 10 to the 0.6, ladies and gentlemen, is not a little bit stronger. It's phenomenally stronger. The Kobe earthquake was about four times as strong. That's no joke. Four times as strong. I mean, I would think double as strong would be like horrifying. Four times as strong is really, really scary. And I won't go through this with you, but it turns out you can play the same game with this stuff right here. Notice I've got hydrogen ion concentration. You've heard about that, that's called pH. Guess what hydrogen ion concentration is? It's a log scale. When you actually hear things, you know what decibels are? You've heard of decibels? That's also a log scale. And because of those logarithmic scales, if, if I was, I, I unfortunately have my uh, little uh, air purifier on, but can you guys hear this? That is, and you have these little bones in your ear that vibrate. You can hear that, right? In terms of it's like the actual force of the sound that I'm creating, that would be sort of like 10 to the minus four, but you can still hear it. But if there was a big bomb that went out, would you hear that? Your ears actually work on logarithmic scales as well. So you might be hearing 10 to the minus six, but your ears just hear minus six. And then you, you can also hear a billion, your ears just hear something effectively like nine. And without the fact that they are in logarithmic scales, your eyes are as well, by the way. Without that, you would be blinded or deaf very, very rapidly because those big things, you would, you would actually have to make sure your, your ears were much stronger than they are, which would mean if they were that much stronger, you wouldn't be able to hear those quiet things. You wouldn't be able to hear the sound of footsteps on carpet, but you can now, right? So it's actually kind of significant. Your eyes, your ears, there's a lot of things in life that actually work on what are called logarithmic scales. So let's pop out this thing real quick here. So in here, we'll just do one together and then I'm going to pass out what I have for you guys today. So suppose that you invested $2,000. Invested at 3.75 compounded monthly. Now, I, I did go over that because this is the first problem that I have where it literally says, okay, I'm talking about the year, but we're gonna give you little bits and pieces. 
how long will it take for you to reach 3,000? What's the first thing you're going to have to do? You're going to have to divide by 2,000, and you're going to do it with 1.5. Now I'm going to convert 1 plus 0 0.0375 divided by 12 to a decimal, which is 1.003125. Hey, now that I have my exponential isolated, what do we want to do? What was the whole deal that we just talked about? Every time you see that variable up top, we take a log. So I'm going to take the natural log just because I like it. You may not. And so the only thing I have left to do is divide this log by 12 of those logs and I will have exactly how long it should take my money to hit that $3,000 mark. So I got the natural log of one and a half. I'm gonna divide that by 12 of these natural logs of 1.003125. And according to this, it's going to take 12.83 or 10.83 what? What is time measured in in this case? Years. Okay. And that's kind of my story. So I know that took a little while, but that's just kind of what I had to get to. So we don't need to graph. We just take some logs and it works out okay. So um, the only other thing that I had for you guys today is we were supposed to take a quiz. I've got five whole minutes left. Somehow that's not going to fit. I, I'm pretty aware that you're not going to rip through this whole quiz in five flat minutes. And I also wanted to give you a review. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you both of those and uh, the review is actually going to be due on Monday, uh, not, excuse me, the quiz is going to be due on Monday. Now it actually says right up on the top of it that it's a group quiz. So you guys can interact with each other a little bit via Zoom, however you do that, communicating back and forth. Uh, but the reason I wanted to do that 